Didn't bump teeth that time. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's awesome to be here in the great state of New York. I always love to uh, come here, play, and uh, just enjoy it myself. I want to thank Rennie. Uh, I feel like I've been uh, knowing him for at least a couple years now. Uh, uh, he's been calling me, talking to me, and asking me uh, many, many different questions about certain things. And uh, I thought my wife actually thought he was writing a book, <laughs> and which he probably could. Uh, as I've heard here tonight, love baseball. You know, I thought New York just was a rowdy bunch when you come up here and go down to the stadium and, you know, not many people uh, from the opposing teams uh, uh, enjoy playing around. But I, every time I come here, I just loved it. I communicated with the fans. I get as close as I am to you now. Uh, you know, I started off as a third baseman. Tigers moved me to uh, be a second baseman. I had to work very hard to uh, hone my skills. As Rennie has mentioned many times, Alan Tram and I, uh, they called us the uh, gold dust twins. He was the gold and I was the dust. <laughs> uh, one uh, writer used to call, uh, uh, say something about, am I Tram's shadow or something like that because Tram got all the recognition. And that's paper-wise. On the field, we all know, uh, uh, they used to call me the spark plug of the, uh, of the team. Uh, as, uh, Mr. Bobby Valentine mentioned, I think I actually played against him maybe when I was a rookie. And he was probably near the end of his career. But baseball, as was said, baseball was a lot different than, uh, I think, all the coaches during the uh, 60s, 70s, maybe early 80s, hit the pop-up. You know, the catchers actually did that. And then California Angels had a uh, coach, I forget his name, Jimmy Reese. Jimmy Reese. He would run the pitchers. And as the pitcher, pitchers would run, do their little sprints in the outfield before game, he could hit the line drive and it'd be right on target. I mean, he uh, worked that fungo like Magic. But I've had the opportunity to play against a lot of wonderful people. I've had a, a wonderful time doing something that I love. And uh, I'm not going to sit here and give out numbers because I've never uh, thought about numbers when I played. I played the game, had a lot of fun, and uh, tried to do it the way a baseball was to be played. Played uh, for a wonderful manager for 17 and a half years, Sparky Anderson. We got along. I didn't give him any problems. He didn't give me any problems. Maybe uh, during the game, if I saw something that was, uh, that I may not have liked, Gates Brandon and I would sit on the other end of the bench, and we would have our conversation there. But Sparky ran the team, and what he said went. And I think I was a, you know, just a, a, a guy who went out every day and led by example. You know, I wasn't a media guy. I'm still not a media guy because my game spoke for itself. Uh, what can I say after, you know, having a good game? I could talk more about myself if I had a bad game. And that's the way I, I play. So I've had a wonderful time here. Tell the Kirby Puckett story. Will. Kirby Puckett. <laughs> and actually, in the uh, sports grill, Diane and I, we were over there eating, and I'm looking at all those pictures over there, and I look, and it's Kirby Puckett, and Herbick, and Diana. Uh, no, Brunanski. <laughs> Brunanski was the other night. I had to go and look at that one, because I thought it might have uh, been one of the other guys. But Minnesota has some wonderful guys. I love that, that baseball team. But many teams have wonderful players, and you know, uh, I enjoyed uh, playing with those guys. Game is totally different today. I've heard a little bit about that today. It's, it's, it's a little bit different, but Sparky Anderson uh, cleared that up and uh, uh, 
79 or so when he came to Detroit because we had players right after um, taking batting practice, they would go in the clubhouse. But when Spark Anderson came, he stopped that. And matter of fact, when we, as we stayed out on the field, we had to stay out in full uniform. We didn't go out in uh, t-shirts. We looked professionally, batting practice, during the game, and even as we traveled on the road. So I want to thank everybody, and let me get to this Curry Puckett real quick. Oh, I think it was 1983, Enos Cabell was playing with Detroit. You know, Enos played with uh, Houston Astros during those days. But we picked him up in like 82 and 83, and he played with Nolan Ryan. So one day we were, I uh, think, at Coco, uh, playing Houston Astros. We had played our five innings, took a shower, and Ennis wanted to go over and say hello to Nolan Ryan. So we, I went with Ennis, we went over, and uh, as we were all talking, there was this little young kid come over, and he stood by us, and he says, he says, hey, Mr. Brick, how you doing? And I looked, I said, I'm fine, how you doing? He says, one day you're gonna see me in the major leagues. I looked and I said, okay. And that summer, Kirby Puckett was in the uh, center field starting with the Minnesota Twins in 1983. One of the best hitters I've ever seen, scariest is hitter, one of the scariest hitters I've ever seen. When he hit a ball back through the middle, I'm at second base and it scared me because he hit it so hard, you've seen pitchers get hit. Kirby Puckett hit the ball up the middle consistently and the other way that hard. And I, I mean, sometimes I, I just fear for pitchers uh, when that ball go up the middle because, you know, you get hit and hurt. But anyway, the, the whole story behind that was Kirby Puckett, little kid, one of the best ball players, and everybody knows he passed away, of, I don't know how many years now, but uh, a wonderful man. Uh, and I could say that for a lot of them, George Brett, Oh wow, it's just so oh, it's just so many guys. And I, I had the privilege of playing with them. So thank everybody. Love you, New York. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere, right? You guys have been great. Love you. Thank you very much. It uh, certainly is a pleasure for myself to be invited up to Troy uh, to be a recipient of uh, the Hall of Fame. Uh, as a member of the Mets for 18 years these days, when you look in the standings, it's a pleasure to be invited any place. <laughs> but when you, uh, when Reddy called me, I want to thank him for inviting me up here. Uh, you know, it was quite a thrill. I had participated in sports in the Bronx I played uh, basketball and uh, baseball at Monroe High School, made all city in both of them. So I went through the program of the public schools and uh, always stayed in New York. I love it. It's a great town. I didn't realize the tradition up here uh, in Troy was so great. And I congratulate all the gentlemen that have gone into the Hall of Fame here. You certainly should be proud of your records. And this area certainly has a tremendous tradition uh, in baseball. I want to thank my friends Ralph Ranker for saying those kind words. We've been friendly for 50 years, and Ralph gives more to charity than just about anybody. You don't read about it because he doesn't look to publicize it. But he's at every, I mean, he has been at every golf event over the years, and it's the same old faces that you see there. And Ralph, I'm glad to see that you're here. We're going in together. Thank you. Thank you. Bobby, we played together. We were on the bench together. We sat in Joe Torrey's locker together in his office for many, many games because you didn't play and I didn't play. But the only difference was by the come the eighth inning, I had an opportunity to pinch hit when the winning run was on base and had a chance to do something. So we spent a lot of days talking baseball. I didn't realize I was so good, Bobby, when you mentioned all those 
things I did, how come you never called me as a coach? <laughs> I mean, if I would have been able to travel with you, I'd have had another 20 years in the major leagues. I mean, but maybe I'll go back to school with you, that's all. But it is a pleasure to be involved. Rennie asked me to bring up some stories back in the early 60s. And you know, it's pretty difficult for me because sometimes I don't remember a lot of this stuff. If you ask my wife who's here tonight, she traveled up here with me, she'll tell you I can't remember things they did two weeks ago. <laughs> so I don't, you know, I don't have to be a little careful. But I want to thank my son for coming down from Boston with his family. They traveled over here, they've been celebrating for two weeks. My two grandsons and my daughter-in-law, my little granddaughter, they came down, they wanted to celebrate with me tonight. My lovely wife is here and her friend Kathy, and they're spending a great time tonight in Troy. The way I got my wife up here, you guys have to realize, you gotta be a little smart about these things. Pick your battles, etc. cetera. I, I originally said, you know, I was elected into the Hall of Fame. She thought that was a great idea. I said, but you know, we have about a three and a half hour trip to celebrate. That's where we're gonna to go to get inducted. She thought I was going to the Caribbean. She didn't know how I was coming up to Troy in, in the car, on the throughway. So I gotta make it up to her a little bit. So thanks for, for inviting me up here. But I will say my career started in the Major Leagues 1962. Uh, I signed in June of 62. I was 17, never banging out of the Bronx. Never was on a plane, but the Mets ushered me out there. I thank Bubba Janard for doing that. He put me on a plane and said, go to California. Well, I did. I wound up in LA. I thought it was kind of strange that Dodger <coughs> Bus was waiting to pick me up. They took me to the ballpark. My first night in the major leagues, the little left-handed that Ralph knew was pitching that night. He wound up setting a record, pitched a no-hitter, struck out 13 Mets happened to be Sandy Koufax, and I told Casey, who was my first manager, I'm going back to college. This was tough. This, this, you know, the next night we had Don Drysdale, and then Johnny Padres, the third pitcher, and things got tougher and tougher, and you know, with the Mets, you had the good, bad, the ugly, and, and we celebrated rainouts in the early years. And, and, but Casey was great to play for. He, he loved the young players. He worked with us, he tried to build a ball, ball club up around, surrounded by young players. We were the first expansion team to make it to the playoffs and win a World Series. So certainly yeah, we enjoyed his ability to pass along his 50 years of baseball. Some of you guys should have been coaching down there. You've got an awful lot of years of baseball up here. You could have gave us an awful lot of advice, but Casey was great. He took a lot of the pressure off the players in the early years. You know, he knew we had a bad ball club players at the twilight of their careers, and he tried to uh, take the pressure off from the newspapers. Because, believe me, the newspaper guys are looking for stories, sensationalism. You can say one little thing, and of course, if you have a name, you're going to be headlines. And Johnny Murphy told me, Ed, believe about 50% of what you read in the papers. Well, after all those years, I believe about 25% of what's written in the papers because they're looking for sensationalism, as Bobby will tell you. It doesn't take much to make the headlines. If you're successful, they're gonna go after you, and they're vicious. But he was great. I'll tell you what, he, if it was a good day, bad day, he would handle the press, keep it away from the players. And I remember in 1964, the Cardinals were in a pennant race. There were four teams going down to the stretch, just like this year in baseball. Everybody had a chance to win with a week to go. Well, we went into St. Louis to beat the, play the Cardinals the last three days of the year. The Mets were always looking to save money. Nothing has changed there. <laughs> they left half their players in New York, and they take a, a half a squad to St. Louis. We play the Cardinals, and they're just smiling as we come to the plate because four teams are tied, Philadelphia, Cincinnati, there was another team in themselves and whoever won the last three games was going to be in the pennant, win the pennant. Well, the first game, Gibson pitches, we beat them 1-0. I get a base hit, we beat them 1-0. Now, the next day, actually, no, it wasn't Gibson, it was another pitch on Friday. Gibson pitched on Saturday. I get up to the plate on Saturday, I was the leadoff hitter, and Casey calls timeout. 
you know, the umpire calls him out to the field and he says, you know, Ed, you got a problem out here. The lineup is wrong. And I said, what do you mean the lineup's caught? You don't have a pitcher. Well, when Casey went out to change pitches the day before, the Cardinals had called in a pitcher because he raised both of his hands and he brings in a left-hander and Al Jackson pitches and gets two outs for Kenny Boyer. He said, well, you picked him yesterday, pick him today. Well, you got a problem. When you, you embarrass the umpires in baseball, they're going to show you up. And about five innings went by, and Gibson's pitching fast. He wants to get guys out in a hurry. He's trying to win a pennant. Next thing you know it, we get into the sixth inning, and, and I hear Al Bollock say, Chris Canazaro, you're thrown out of the ball game. And Casey jumped up and said, hey, Al, if you're going to throw him out, you better yell awful loud. We shipped him to Buffalo yesterday. <laughs> we had so many changes of players. The personnel was crazy. I mean, you went on a road trip. I might go on a road trip rooming with Bobby Valentine. I'd come back rooming with somebody else, Frank Thomas. You never know. We were making moves. We had no idea. So you just didn't unpack your bags. You went to the ballpark every day. You looked up in your locker. If your uniform was there, you celebrated. If it wasn't, you know, you just said, well, where am I going now? And we had a lot of changes. But I was fortunate to play for, oh, seven or eight, maybe ten managers, including Yogi Berra, the great icon of the Yankees. And I was a Yankee fan growing up in the Bronx, so I, I loved the Yankees. Then, of course, we had Salty Parker, Roy McMillan, oh, Give me some of those other Joe names. Joe Torrey Hodges. Joe, well, Joe Torrey was my last manager. He was my roommate. Gil Hodges was the guy that turned the ball club around. Gil was great, great leader for us. That's how we won the pennant in 69. He changed the whole makeup of the ball club. Pitching and defense was the important thing. And he, we went from spring training in last place. Comes June, we finally beat the Cubs and we wound up winning the pennant by 10 games. And then the last two or three managers, we played Joe Frazier, and then Bobby Valentine joined us. He wasn't the manager, but he was learning quick with all these guys making all these moves. And then my roommate became the manager of the Mets, and I figured I had a good thing going. That was Joe Torrey, and he's the only one I did not last. Wound up, um, re well, retiring after the 79 season. Bobby wound up retiring from baseball and on to manage. But it was a great thing that we had. I love playing for the Mets. I love New York. There's no finer city to play in. They have great fans, loyal support. I just hope the organization goes out and, and does something to make the product top shelf again. I saw the ups and downs, the roller coaster in 62. We won in 69. We lost for a couple years. We won again in 73. Went to the bottom, I retired, and they won again in 86. Well, they've been struggling, so let's just hope that uh, the Mets make some moves this winter, become professional again, bring an organization back to New York that they deserve. The Yankees have been winning. They've got a tremendous tradition. Well, the Mets can have a tradition also. You know, forget about what happened in the past. You know, make your organization number one and try to win. But thank you very much for inviting me tonight. We enjoyed it. Good evening. Um, the short clip they had of me, there's a reason why uh, I wasn't uh, on, on the TV or the radio live because there's no telling what I'm going to say, right? Uh, I shoot from the hip. Lou, I have to apologize, first of all, to Lou Whitaker. He probably doesn't remember this, but pitchers remember everything. 1978, Tiger Stadium, probably in July. We're losing 8 nothing. I come in from Toronto, pitch the 7th and 8th inning. Bottom of the 8th inning, we're down 8 nothing. We got two hits. We're going to lose. Two outs. Round the floor, your leadoff hitter, one of my teammates, gets a base hit, no big deal. Next pitch, steal second, that, you know. That's not the thing to do. I yell at the floor, I peer in Lou, I drill Lou, all right? So he's on first. So now I'm thinking about drilling the next seven guys to get to the floor again. 
but I know Hartsfield won't keep me in the game, all right? I know he's going to take me out. So I said, you know what? Let's get the next guy out. Got the next guy out. Three years later, I drilled the floor, all right? We never forget. We never forget. There's a couple guys I still owe, all right? They're on the West Coast. I will make my way out there. I don't like to fly. Anyways, I appreciate the fact. Can we raise this thing up? My God, I got a bad back and it's getting worse as we talk. I thank everybody. This is, uh, the funny thing is, when Rennie called me and left a message at my indoor academy, I didn't really think it was serious. Uh, at the time, I called back, I didn't hear from Rennie for like maybe a week and a half. And at that time, I had 11 high school friends north of Albany playing golf. Typical high school, bunch of idiots. The reason why they wanted me to drive up is one guy brings the beer, one guy brings the food, one guy brings whatever. I bring the bail money, all right? My, my high school friends were nuts. I couldn't show up. I figured they're doing a prank on me. They're doing a prank. All of a sudden, I go up to Hartwick to do an alumni golf outing. Everybody's congratulating me. I go, what do you mean? New York State Baseball Hall. Congratulations, put it on the paper, put it on the news. I go, oh my God, this is real, all right? And all of a sudden, it hit me, you know, which is pretty cool, all right? Sometimes as a youngster, we don't, we just play to play, all right? You know, we didn't really, you know, guys make a lot of money, we made money, don't, don't get me wrong, all right? We, we enjoyed getting paid, but the bottom line is, we didn't play to get paid, we played to play, all right? Bobby will tell you, I played against Bobby down in uh, Dominican Republic. He played for Tommy Lasorda, I played for Felipe, for Felipe Alou, all right? Stayed at the Haragua, remember? Good times, good times, right? <laughs> yeah, really. All right, a couple people in my life, all right? Mickey Lambros, he got a piece of me. All right? He got a piece of me my senior year in college, but before that it was Freddie Esposito. Freddie Esposito was my first baseball coach with a real uniform. 12-year-old travel team out of Syracuse, New York. I was nine, he picked me. I was a tough little kid, he picked me, all right? He was firm, he was fair. We didn't play by the rules that young kids play like, you know, Bobby gets a trophy, everybody gets a trophy. It wasn't like that, all right? We were tougher people. We were tougher, all right? If you didn't deserve to play, you didn't play. You didn't work hard in practice, you didn't play, all right? If he told you to learn a team rule or a baseball rule and you didn't know it, you didn't play, all right? So once you learn the right way to play, then the game becomes a piece of cake, all right? It's tough because you're always competing, but it's a piece of cake. All right, here's a great name for you, Stubby Overmeyer. Baseball names are great, Stubby. My first manager in A-ball. Come out of Hartwick, signed, sent me to second spring training. I go to Lakeland, Florida to play for Stubby. Stubby's about this big little lefty pitcher, all right? He goes, you're doing all right, kid, just do what you want to do. I said, okay, so I go out there, my first eight games, I go seven and one, I got eight complete games. Because at that time, Bob, will tell you, I didn't get paid to start games, I got paid to finish games, all right? None of the six innings and fly, five innings and fly, a seventh inning guy, eighth inning guy, ninth inning guy. No, you just you finish the game, all right? I get sent to AAA, all right? I call my wife, where is she? Lovely woman, stood behind me the whole time. Really, I mean, supporting? You don't know the life of an athlete. Once we get on a roll, we are so determined to, to do what we have to do and so regimented. They're like in our wake, and she stayed in my wake the whole time, never left my side. God bless her, all right? Anyways, I call her up on the phone and say, after six weeks in eight ball, seven weeks out of college, I'm going to AAA. I'm this close to the big leagues. She goes, you don't sound happy. I'm not happy. Why aren't you happy? Well, I'm going to put a T for Toledo on my chest. I don't want a T. I want a D for Detroit. All right? I don't want to mi minimize this at all. I want to get to the big leagues. Next year I was in the big leagues, all right? My first roommate was Frank Howard, Hondo, all right? Got me to the ballpark at about noon for an eight o'clock game. I go, okay, Hondo, what do we do now? I mean, talk baseball, all right? Greatest teammate I had, Al Kaline. Right? Only got to play with him for a year and a half. Hall of Famer, great player. Work ethic that you could not believe. Was very quiet was very strong-willed. 1974, when he got his 3,000th hit in Baltimore off of Dave McNally. Dave McNally threw a little sinker away, threw a hit double down the right field line for his 3,000th hit. Anyways, every day, Al was our designated hitter. He was not gonna play. That was his last year. 
when his group stopped hitting, all right, when his group stopped hitting in batting practice, he went out to right field and shake balls off the bat. And at the time that with the Tigers, Lou wasn't there yet. We had some younger players who were just breaking into the big leagues. When their group was done, they went in the clubhouse. And I'm going, something's wrong with this picture. Something is definitely wrong. Here's a veteran that goes out there, and he's never going to play in the outfield. And you know what? This is the guy I want to be. I'm going to overwork. I wasn't blessed. I was blessed with a good body, all right? I wasn't blessed with a tremendous amount of baseball talent. All right? I was more of a football player, all right? I just happened to be able to throw the ball pretty good and throw strikes most of the time. Sorry, Lou, again, that was a pretty good throw, you know? I, I drilled him good, all right? Anyways, all right? But it's, it's just, it's a remarkable, I forget who said it, but we waste ourselves when you're young, we don't really appreciate what we're doing, all right? We just go out there every day, but fortunately we realize that it will end, all right? I retired 32, 33 years ago, and things like this just bring back so many cool memories, right? Moments in time. I could talk about a moment in time, and it would last like 45 minutes. And that was just one moment out of a nine-year career, which is nothing. All right, but it's a lot more than people were really hope for. It's a lot more than people, when, when the kids dream about playing in the big leagues, all right, all they want to do is step on the field one day, one day, and feel that. F just feel the exuberance, all right? We used to make a joke. We used to be out in the field watching a foul ball go in the stands, watching guys die for the ball, ripping $1,000 suits, knocking kids over, knocking old ladies over, spilling their food, spilling their beer, all this stuff. I'm going, look at those idiots. They're sitting in the stands like this, and they're chasing a ball. I gotta walk over to this bag and take a ball out, put it in my pocket, I got a ball. You know, I don't have to chase it, all right? What's, what's the big deal? It's a freaking baseball, all right? But evidently, it's a memento. It's a memento of a moment that people cherish. And trust me when I tell you, I will cherish this moment for as long as I live. Thank you. so many distinguished honorees. Uh, uh, one will be up here later who played his first game for me in the major leagues. I had the honor of being a great uh, Ed Cranepool's roommate, uh, teammate in, with the New York Mets. Uh, the room happened to be Joe Torrey's office where we watched the game from until they needed Eddie to come out and get a big pitch hit and win a game. Uh, if it wasn't for these uh, Honored second baseman that you have here tonight. I probably have another hundred wins on my resume, but uh, they all beat my brains in every time we played against them. So congratulations to uh, Craig and Lou and uh, Mark. Uh, but you know, Remy called me and said, "Hey, you got to keep the introduction short." Uh, the amazing thing is, his introduction of Ralph was much longer than the introduction that I have. Uh, but I appreciate you you allowing me to tell you that. Uh, the guy you're honoring here is, was the youngest guy to win 21 games until Dwight Gooden did it. Uh, he's a guy who was pitching in the major leagues uh, as a teenager. He's a guy who pitched in, started World Series games, started All-Star games, pitched over 25,000 pitches in his major league career as remembering for one. And every pitch that he threw, I think uh, as we get older, those pitches got better. But uh, as, as I mentioned, Eddie being a great pinch hitter and probably one of the great hitters that I ever saw in a uniform, uh, the guy that I'm proud to call my father-in-law is the number one person that I've ever met in my life. He's articulate, he's a, intelligent, he's a humanitarian, he's a uh, artist. Uh, he was a Renaissance man before they knew how to spell it. And uh, he happens to be uh, your guest of honor tonight, so without any further ado, he's going to stay down here, and I'm going to introduce the one and the only Ralph Branca. Uh, Bobby said I was articulate. I don't even know how to spell it. <laughs> but uh, first of all, the other award winners, congratulations, well-deserved. And of course, I know 
you for coming out of the James Bond home, a New York boy going into New York, into a New York City. And of course, Ed has the most hits of any Met player. I think that's correct. Oh, Dave Wright beat him out. Sorry about that, <laughs> folks. But the guy got more uh, important hits than Dave Wright and Craig Paul. Now, you know, baseball's been a part of my life since I was six years old. I remember my older brother, oldest brother, Julius, playing, and uh, he played left field, and they had a slanted field like Cincinnati, and the ball was hit over his head, oh, you're and he tried to chase it, it went flat on, right on his face, and broke his nose. And the thing I remember, him coming back, and me sitting next to him, and feeling the warmth of his uh, uniform, of course they all were made of wool in those days, because he lasted. And that's my first recollection of baseball. But the same brother Julius and my old, another older brother, Ed, used to take us to the ball games. We'd go to Giant Stadium, they both were Giant fans. Six times a year, Yankee Stadium twice, and Brooklyn was in another atmosphere, another country. But uh, eventually, uh, you know, I played free sports. I played basketball in high school and college. I played for NYU. And believe it or not, I jumped center at six foot three. And that's hard to believe, but the tallest guy I jumped against was only six five. Three years later, they had Dolph Shays, who was about six eight, came in and and then when you really became a very, very good team when he got there. But I've also uh, played football. I uh, wasn't very good. No, I shouldn't say that. I played guard and, and tackle and end. I played for my high school team. NYU did not have a football team. But, uh, you know, my, my love was always baseball. we go to Giant. My family and I would go to the Giant. Uh, games, we'd sit in the upper deck and watch a doubleheader one time with the Dean Brothers pitch against Carl Hubble and, uh, and uh, Hal Schumacher. Both games were one up. It was quite a, game, quite a day. But, you know, this honor is something that, you know, I didn't expect, but I'm really am grateful for it. I want to thank the committee. I want to thank the committee for, you know, for the other players and other honorees, but you know, baseball is still the best game of all. I mean, football does a lot of promoting, but if you want to go really see the action, you go see a baseball game. <laughs> you see what happens. The ball hits to the shortstop and he misses it, you know who made the error. In football, when a guy tries to run up the middle or something, and he gets smeared, you don't know which player missed the missed the tackle or, or missed his tackle, the opposite opponent tackle. So basketball, well, they play 48 minutes, and I still don't know why. Because <laughs> they really should play the last six, because that's what they do anyhow. They lollygag along to the last six, and if you're within five points or what, or even nine, you can win the game. But uh, hockey, I can't skate, so I don't know anything about hockey. But I just want to say, for all of you who came here, thank you for attending. I'm very appreciative of this honor. And I want to say the same to all the other families, especially my friend Ed Crankle, who I know a long time. God bless you and your family. And God bless all of you for coming. Thank you. God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans, 
light with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home.